inside of one. Literally one hand. One hand to the bottom in most places. Look at that. Alright everyone, me and Clayton are out today. We're doing a little prospecting. We're trying to find a bottle dump in a town that we've been after for a long time. Uh, what we're looking at right here is actually an original bottler from the 1880s. And the building is still standing and it's abandoned. Uh, we can't help but think that there's probably a bunch of bottles up underneath it. Uh, but we're not going to venture into it because we don't know who owns it. We may look up the property record and see who owns it and if there's back taxes owed or any of that good stuff. If we can figure it out, we'd like to go underneath at least into the crawl space and see if there's anything under there. But we're about to head a little east of where we're at now. And we're going to show you where we, we've been prospecting and uh, kind of just show you how we look for bottle dumps today. Like any good search, it always begins on the creek. Now, we're in the winter time, but back during the summer, I started right here and I walked this creek all the way up as far as I could looking for glass and this is on the east side of the town that we're looking at obviously I'm not going to give you the town name but this is on the east side of the town because that's the way that the wind blew what that did is that kept the stench out of the town so that they didn't have to smell the garbage so by looking in the creek looking for old glass I kind of ruled out that the garbage dump was on, directly on this creek so what we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to go look for some lower lying areas. So that's what we're about to do right now is head over to where there's a few fields that we know that flood. We're going to start probing in them and see what we can find. Alright, so this is kind of what the street looks like that we're looking at. And you can see all these houses. Here in Alabama, this is what we call shotgun houses. And this was the extremely, extremely poor area of the town. And uh, the reason they called these shotgun houses was because you could shoot your shotgun right through the front door and it would go all the way out the back without hitting anything. Now the reason we're looking in this area that was poor was because they didn't want to put the nasty dump next to the prominent area where the rich folks lived at. They wanted to put it where the people they didn't care about lived at in the industrial section of town. So these houses, a lot of them were workers for different iron and steel plants and things like that. Uh, a lot of them were African-American as well. So sadly, their stuff was taken for granted, and uh, they <laughs> they kind of got the, the crap into the deal. But that gives us a good starting area. So now we're looking for some empty lots. <laughs> There's no freaking, I don't know if that's a root or, it's not a rock. We are on an empty lot, kind of, on one of these shotgun lots. I mean, there's a house right there. We're in between the lots trying to see if we can hit an area that has a soft spot in it. Usually what we'll do is we'll hit the four corners. We'll hit a corner here, a corner here, one in the center, and then one back behind us on each corner. This is for a town dump, not a privy. Yeah, this is for a town dump. We're not after a privy. We're after a town dump, just to clarify that. Oh, I stuck. <laughs> We are uh, looking at what possibly could have been a privy right here. There's a big divot in the ground. There again, we're not looking for privies, but uh, if we think there's one there, we're going to definitely explore it. One of the theories that a lot of diggers have is that in dumps, there were what was called trash trees. And uh, instead of having like oaks and different things like that, the trees are a uh, really slick bark. I'm not sure the actual type of tree it is, but we always called them trash trees. And all the dumps these trees right here are abundant in them also a little side note is is if you're in an area and you're looking for a bottle dump and say you don't have a shovel with you you can look for fence posts signs you can even look for telephone poles and you can look where they dug to put the post in the ground and you can look for glass surrounding it that way you didn't have to do the test hole it was already done for you but that's just a little side trick for anybody that's actually looking for a dump and say you don't have your tools with you use the uh, the stuff that's around you. I mean, if they dug a telephone pole, they dug probably eight or ten feet deep to be able to set that pole and it be steady. So there would be an abundance of glass surrounding the pole. All right, so we found a concrete foundation to what looks to be an outhouse, and he's about to show you just about how easy that thing will slide in the ground inside of one. 
literally one hand one hand to the bottom in most places look at that it should be like that now the ground around here as you've seen me try to do already what's that a bottle or glass okay as you've seen me try around here gr the ground isn't as uh soft as that so that's a sure sign of right <laughs> right but that thing's hard that ain't sliding down in the ground though so that's that's a sure sign of definite old outhouse i have had many questions since the start of my youtube channel on how we find our dig locations one of the top resources for relic and treasure hunters is the use of old maps for us the use of sandborn maps is a must they help us in many instances to determine dig locations for bottle digging and metal detecting. So I figured it would be a good time to discuss what exactly Sanborn maps are and how we use them. First we're going to touch on the history of the Sanborn company. In the late 18th century, insurance companies in London began to create detailed maps to give underwriters the information they needed to assess fire risk. The practice was adopted by American insurance companies in the mid 19th century. Demand for fire insurance mapping grew rapidly after the end of the Civil War. Factors such as the Homestead Act, railroad construction, the Second Industrial Revolution, and massive immigration to the U.S. all fostered huge population growth, urbanization, and heightened demand for mapping. Daniel Sanborn, a civil engineer and surveyor, began working on fire insurance maps in 1866. That year he was contracted by an insurance company to prepare maps of areas in Tennessee and Boston. Seeing a lucrative market for this type of map, he established the D.A. Sanborn National Insurance Diagram Bureau in New York City to publish the Boston Atlas and develop and sell maps of additional areas. Within several decades, the company became the largest and most successful American map company. This growth came about through savvy management and the buyout of competing firms. In 1916, Sanborn purchased its last major competitor and it became a monopoly. The Sanborn Company sent out legions of surveyors to map building footprints in all major urbanized areas, along with building details related to fire risk. At its peak in the 20s, the company employed about 700 people, including 300 field surveyors, 400 cartographers, printers, managers, salesmen, and support staff. The maps were originally created to allow fire insurance companies to assess their total liability in urbanized areas of the United States. But since they contain detailed information about properties and individual buildings in approximately 12,000 U.S. cities and towns, Sanborn maps are invaluable for documenting changes in the built environment of American cities over many decades. Sanborn held their monopoly over fire insurance maps for the majority of the 20th century. But the business declined as U.S. insurance companies stopped using maps for underwriting in the 1960s. The last Sanborn fire maps were published on microfilm in 1977, but old Sanborn maps remain useful for historical research into urban geography, and that's where we come in. The map volumes contain an enormous amount of information. The maps include outlines of each building and outbuilding, the location of windows, doors, street names, street and sidewalk widths, property boundaries, firewalls, natural features such as rivers, canals, etc., railroad corridors, building use, sometimes even particular room uses, house and block number, as well as the composition of building materials, including the framing, flooring, and roofing materials, the strength of the local fire department, indications of sprinkler systems, locations of fire hydrants, location of water and gas mains, and even the names of the most public buildings, churches, and businesses. Unique, u the unique information includes the location of the homes of prominent individuals, brothels, and more ephemeral buildings including outhouses and stables. All of this information can be used by people such as us to help paint a clear picture of a town and how it was laid out. Okay guys, shortly after finding this privy slash outhouse, the bottom literally fell out and it just started pouring rain so we didn't have time to dig it or anything like that uh, so it's going to be to be continued on what's in that hole uh, that being said we're expecting between six and ten inches of rain in the next five days here in alabama so it's a little bit ridiculous i think i've been seeing the animals line up two by two and down the road out there <laughs>
But uh, in either case, uh, we hope that you enjoyed the video. I know it was a little short this week, but we tried to throw a little bit of information in there that may be useful for other people that are looking for their dump sites or privies or outhouses. The Sanborn maps are a big part of what we do. I can't stress that enough. So y'all be sure to check those out. Use them in your research, and I hope that it will benefit you as much as it has us. In either case, we will see you in the next video. Yeah.